From Fire Arrows to Spaceflight, A History of Rockets Informational Essay As early as 400 BCE, logical and observant inventors in Greece used steam to propel simple devices. A man named Architus used steam to send a wooden pigeon gliding along high wires. These early steam-propelled devices were of little practical use. They were mainly used for entertainment. Over a thousand years later, and thousands of miles away from Greece, Chinese alchemists learned to make gunpowder. By around 1100 CE, the Chinese were using gunpowder to make fireworks, which were used for celebrations. Simple grenade-like bombs were used in war. Before long, the Chinese learned to use gunpowder to propel fire arrows through the air. The same basic principle of propulsion was at work in Architus's giddy pigeon and in Chinese fire arrows. But the special properties of gunpowder made the fire arrows useful tools of war. In 1232, Chinese soldiers used fire arrows to defeat Mongol invaders at the Battle of Kei Ken. This is the first known use of rockets in the history of warfare. To make these simple rockets, the Chinese filled a short bamboo tube with gunpowder. They capped one end of the tube, then they attached it to an arrow. Then the gunpowder was ignited. It produced fire, smoke, and gas that escaped through the open end of the tube. This force propelled the rocket through the air. The arrow helped to keep the rocket steady during flight, though its course remained quite variable. These earliest rockets may not always have done much damage on impact, but a deluge of many fire arrows could cause outright fear in the enemy. Gaining something in defeat, the Mongols learned to make similar rockets. The new technology spread rapidly across Asia and Europe, but improvements in the basic design proceeded slowly, at a sluggish pace, until more modern days. By the verge of the Industrial Age, military rockets were becoming more effective weapons. In 1780, Hyder Ali of Mysuru, a kingdom in India, used heavy iron case rockets to defeat British forces. His son, Tipu Sultan, used the same rockets against the British with similar success. Mysorean rockets were not used merely to scare and intimidate the enemy. They were deadly weapons that cut down troops in their path. They were also used to set fire to ammunition and supplies. Determined to avenge themselves, British forces finally defeated Tipu Sultan's army in 1799. The kingdom of Maisoru ceded territory to the British Empire and became subordinate to its authority. The British soon developed their own weapons. The British based their rockets on the Mysorean rockets. A model described by William Congreve in 1807 set the standard for the Congreve rocket. The British used the Congreve rocket against the United States during the War of 1812. The rocket's red glare, remembered in the Star-Spangled Banner, refers to the fiery tint of the Congreve rockets in action. By the 19th century, technology no longer moved at a saunter. The rate of change in tools of peace and war was accelerating as never before. Advances in artillery made rockets obsolete for several decades. But by the 20th century, Engineers were designing sophisticated rockets for use as spacecraft and as devastating missile systems. Rockets returned to the forefront of military technology. They also helped liberate humanity from Earth's gravity to explore outer space. And while rocket science has come a long way since its beginnings, it's likely to wind up light years ahead of its present state in time. Avenge. Avenge. Avenge is a verb meaning to get revenge for, or to punish someone or get satisfaction for a wrong or injury. John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln to avenge the South's defeat in the Civil War. Or, in the 18th century, a gentleman might fight a duel to avenge an insult to his honor. Now let's hear you say avenge. Try the word again. Seed Seed. Seed is a verb meaning to give up, to surrender, or to hand over. After World War I, Germany was obliged to cede some of its territory to Poland. And, by failing to call up his reserves quickly enough, 
the general ceded victory to the enemy commander. Now you try, Seed. One more time. Deluge. Deluge. Deluge functions as two parts of speech. It can be used as a noun meaning a great flood, a heavy rain, or anything that comes in vast quantity. A deluge of job applications may overwhelm a personnel office. Or deluge can be used as a verb meaning to flood. Rainstorms deluged parts of Southern California for ten straight days. Now it's your turn. Say deluge. Repeat the word. Discretion. Discretion. Discretion is a noun meaning good judgment, care in speech and action, or freedom to judge or to choose. Polls have indicated that voters prefer public officials who conduct themselves with discretion. And guided tours usually allow some free time to be used at the discretion of the individual traveler. Now you say discretion. Repeat the word. Giddy. Giddy. Giddy is an adjective meaning dizzy, lightheaded, or lacking seriousness. Some people like the giddy feeling they get from many amusement park rides. Also, giddy situation comedies are a mainstay of television programming. Your turn. Say giddy. Once again. Impact and impact. Which pronunciation you use depends on how the word functions in a sentence. Let's see how this works. If word six is being used as a noun, meaning the striking of one object against another, or the shock caused by a collision, it is pronounced impact. Impact. A well-made helmet will protect a skater's head from the impact of a fall. Or, computer technology has had a revolutionary impact on the ways people communicate. Well, it's your turn now. Say impact. Once more. The other pronunciation of word six is impact. Impact. This pronunciation is used when word six functions as a verb that means to affect, especially forcefully. Meteors have impacted the surface of our planet, and the bombing of cities during the Second World War impacted the lives of civilians in devastating ways. Now you try impact. Try it again. Let's recap. Word six has two pronunciations. When it's used as a noun, it's pronounced impact. When it's used as a verb, it's pronounced impact. Intimidate. Intimidate. Intimidate is a verb meaning to make timid or frightened by threats, or to use fear to get someone to do or not to do something. Since the dawn of time, soldiers have tried to intimidate enemy troops in various ways. Also. A school bully may try to intimidate younger students into giving up their lunch money. Your turn. Say intimidate. One more time. Liberate. Liberate. Liberate is a verb, meaning to free from bondage or domination, or to release. At the end of World War II, Allied soldiers liberated the survivors of the Nazi death camps. Or, we should do all we can to liberate ourselves from false ideas and antiquated modes of thought. Now let's hear you say "liberate." And again, logical, logical. 
Logical is an adjective, meaning reasonable, or making use of reason and good sense. A student having strong leadership abilities may be the logical choice for class president. And a lawyer may defend the verdict in a case as a logical conclusion based on the evidence presented. Well, it's your turn now. Say logical. Once more. Misrepresent. Misrepresent. Misrepresent is a verb, meaning to give a false or untrue idea of something. A person with something to hide may intentionally misrepresent his or her past. Also, the defense may accuse the prosecution of misrepresenting the case to the jury. Now you say misrepresent. Repeat the word. Optional. Optional. Optional is an adjective, meaning left to one's own choice or not required. A tour package may offer optional side trips to points of only secondary interest. And, in many private educational institutions, wearing a uniform is far from optional. Now you try optional. Once more. Outright. Outright. Outright functions as two parts of speech. It can be used as an adjective meaning complete, instantaneous, or without reservation. A critic may dismiss a new play as an outright ripoff of an earlier hit. Outright can also be used as an adverb that means completely or instantaneously. Not many people have enough money to purchase a new home outright. Now let's hear you say outright. Try the word again. Rendezvous. Rendezvous. Rendezvous can also be used as two parts of speech. It can be used as a verb that means to meet according to a plan. The members of a tour group may be instructed to rendezvous in the hotel lobby at 6 p.m. Or rendezvous can be used as a noun, meaning a meeting by agreement, or a meeting place. A candlelit restaurant may be the ideal place for a romantic rendezvous. Now you say rendezvous. Repeat the word. Rotund. Rotund. Rotund is an adjective meaning rounded and plump, or full and rich in sound. The figures in the paintings of the Flemish artist Peter Paul Rubens are decidedly fleshy and rotund. And a singer's voice may be described as deep, dark, and rotund. Your turn. Say rotund. And again? Saunter. Saunter. Saunter functions as two parts of speech. It can be used as a verb meaning to stroll or to walk in an easy, leisurely way. It is pleasant to sit on a park bench and watch people sauntering along. Or saunter can be used as a noun that means a stroll. You may enjoy a saunter through a beautiful garden in springtime. Now you say saunter. Try the word again. Sluggish. Sluggish. Sluggish is an adjective meaning lazy, slow-moving, or dull and inactive. The three-toed sloth is a sluggish mammal that is native to Central and South America. Also, trading on the stock market may be sluggish on the day before a holiday weekend. Well, it's your turn now. Say sluggish. One more time. Subordinate and subordinate. 
Which pronunciation you use depends on how the word functions in a sentence. If word 17 is used as a verb that means to put in a lower or secondary position, it is pronounced subordinate. Subordinate. A firefighter subordinates personal safety to the well being of the community. Or, level headed people usually subordinate their feelings to their intelligence. Now it's your turn. Say subordinate. Once more. The other pronunciation of word 17 is subordinate. Subordinate. This pronunciation is used when word 17 functions as an adjective, meaning lower in rank or position, or as a noun meaning one who is in a lower position or under the orders of someone else. All federal courts are subordinate to the Supreme Court. Also, the chief executive of a company may give a great deal of responsibility to a trusted subordinate. Now you say subordinate. Repeat the word. Let's recap. Word 17 has two pronunciations. When it's used as a verb, it's pronounced subordinate. When it's used as an adjective or a noun, it's pronounced subordinate. Tint. Tint. Tint functions as two parts of speech. It can be used as a noun, meaning a delicate color, or a slight trace of something. A photographer may use filters of different tints to achieve special effects. Or, tint can be used as a verb that means to give color to, or to dye. The rising sun may tint the clouds a soft pink. Or, a speaker's voice may be slightly tinted with nervousness. Your turn. Say tint. Once more. Variable. Variable. Variable also functions as two parts of speech. It can be used as an adjective that means likely to undergo change, or changeable. The color of a chameleon's skin is variable. Variable can also be used as a noun, meaning a value or quantity that varies, or a symbol for such a value. Many variables may affect a country's economic health. Or, you may be asked to solve an algebraic equation in which x is the variable. Now you say variable. And again. Verge. Verge. Verge is another word that can be two parts of speech. It can function as a noun, meaning the point at which something begins or happens, the brink, or a border or edge. A jolly person may often be on the verge of laughter. Verge also functions as a verb that means to incline or tend toward, or to be in the process of becoming something else. A person's willingness to take risks may verge on recklessness. Well, by now you know the drill. Say verge. Once again.